So last time we were talking about Lewis structures, we said we want uh, to arrange the electrons around the atoms to give them noble gas configuration. There will be a number of exceptions to that, but that is probably the primary idea that guides us when we're trying to decide how to put the electrons in and where to put the atoms. So that's the priority that you want to that you want to have when you're drawing Lewis structures. And then when we talk about formal charge and a couple other things, you'll maybe be able to recognize some of the important exceptions to that. But the noble gas configuration is the primary thing. But as we saw at the end, with that example at the end of uh, class last time, sometimes when you have a number of atoms and some electrons and you're drawing a Lewis structure, there's maybe two or three or four or more ways to draw that Lewis structure where all the atoms have noble gas configuration. But that doesn't mean those structures are all equally stable. So formal charge is a secondary way for us to judge stability of a molecule to see whether that be a likely molecule of form or whether the molecule would be maybe so unstable that we wouldn't have it. So there's a couple ways to think about formal charge. The formula is very helpful and we will show how to use that here in a minute. But just more basic idea of what formal charge is, it really is a way of judging uh, the charge on, that, on an atom the same way we would judge the charge on an atom if it were not involved in bonding, which we already know how to do, right? So let's say I had a sodium with one valence electron. What would its charge be or what would its formal charge be? Well, if I had one valence electron and it were sodium, it's in 1A, that should be the number of valence electrons it needs to be neutral, so it wouldn't have any formal charge, right? So for sodium, it has that one valence electron and it's 3S. If I take that out, and I don't have that valence electron, then what will the charge be? It would be a plus one, right? Because before I take the electron out, the sodium has 11 protons and 11 electrons. When I take the electron out, now I have 10 electrons and 11 protons, so there's an imbalance, and this charge is meant to show that imbalance. So formal charge, is the same thing. Formal charge for atoms that are involved in a molecule sharing electrons, we think of it the same way. But instead of looking at the total number of electrons and the total number of protons for formal charge, we just focus on the valence electrons rather than all of the electrons, right? Because when we're drawing a Lewis structure, we're only showing the valence electrons. So if I have a molecule, or if I have an atom involved in a molecule, so let's say I've got like a carbon bonded to a couple hydrogens and maybe it also has a lone pair. I want to decide for this atom, are the number of positive and negative charges balanced? Or is there too much negative? Or in the case of the sodium where we just saw, is there too much positive? So one way I can do that is to look at the total number of protons and the total number of electrons and look at that and see if it's balanced and see if there's more electrons, it should be negative. If there's more protons, it should be positive. But <coughs> since visually we're not showing all the electrons around the carbon, we're only showing the valence electrons, most people find it easier to, instead of look at the total number of electrons and total number of protons, instead of looking at that, to look at how many electrons are actually around that carbon versus how many sh electrons should it have if it were neutral? All right, so just like with the sodium, we said for the sodium to be neutral, it needed one valence electron because it's in group 1A. So for the carbon to be neutral, since it's in the fourth group A column, it needs, it's in 4A, it needs four valence electrons to be neutral. So So <clears throat> when I look at the element and recognize how many valence electrons it needs to be neutral, that is this part of the equation. If this is the number of electrons it needs to have to be neutral, it needs four. It needs eight to make a noble gas configuration. But I need 
assign four to it and only to it in order to keep its charge balanced. Like, I'm sorry, I'm still confused about this. The two dots for the C, that's equals for eight like around the, the, the lines? Yes. So, two so, what? so there's a difference between counting electrons for formal charge and counting electrons for a noble gas configuration. Okay? So what we said last time was, when I make a bond, those electrons are in an orbital that extends over both atoms. And they are counted for both atoms' noble gas configuration. So the CH bond has two electrons to balance out, uh, well, two electrons to complete the noble gas configuration of the hydrogen, giving it the same number as helium. And those two electrons in combination with the other six count toward the carbon's noble gas configuration, giving it the same number as neon. Okay, so when you're counting valence electrons for a noble gas configuration, they all count because the shared pairs count, both pairs count towards completing both noble gas configurations. But I can't count the electrons the same way for formal charge because I don't want to count the electrons twice because each electron still only has one negative charge. Right? So it's like if I have two electrons shared in here, they're not both electrons counting to balance out the positive charge of the hydrogen and both counting to balance out the positive charge of the carbon. That would be too many electrons. So maybe I should start with a slightly simpler example than this one. So let's, oops, actually let's go here where I've got more space. Let's say I'm just looking at a hydrogen. Right, so for hydrogen to be neutral, since it's in column 1A, it needs one valence electron. Right, so that's a neutral hydrogen. And that has one proton in its nucleus and one electron, right? But it's not stable. Why is it not stable? Because it's less than eight electrons. Well, for hydrogen, the ideal number would be two because that makes a noble gas configuration, not eight. But yeah, it doesn't have a noble gas configuration, right? So to make the elements as stable as possible, we want them to have both a noble gas configuration and a balanced charge. So it has a balanced charge, one proton, one electron, but it doesn't have a noble gas configuration. So give it a, to give it a noble gas configuration, it needs a second electron. That would be then the same number of electrons as helium. For helium, though, helium is element two. It has two protons in its nucleus. So for helium, that's perfect because it has both a noble gas configuration. It is a noble gas. And the number of negatives and positives are balanced. So it has no instability associ associated with creating a charge that's going to start attracting other charges to it. It's perfectly balanced and stable. If I do that with the hydrogen, though, because it only has one proton and now two electrons to give it its noble gas configuration, that will make it stable to an extent, but the charge is really imbalanced. I've got a two to one negative to positive ratio, which is really not stable. The ratio of positive to negative doesn't have to be exactly one to one or balanced, but it needs to be somewhat close. Two to one is way out of whack. So what do I need to do for the hydrogen to make it more stable? Right, I need to bring something else in. So maybe I bring in an extra hydrogen. Right, so when I have my molecule here, and I'm thinking about that line drawn between the hydrogens as a bond, what that comes down to is this situation where I've got the two nuclei, and the electrons are really in an orbital that extends over both nuclei, but the majority of their electron density is between those positive charges where they can make more attraction. Right, so what's nice about this bond is I have two electrons. So those two electrons are surrounding both atoms. So they can complete the noble gas configuration of both atoms. So both nuclei feel like they have two valence electrons. There's still only two total. They both don't have individually two electrons, but because the two electrons are shared, they're able to complete the noble gas configuration for both atoms. But when I'm thinking about these electrons in terms of their formal charge and whether things are balanced, and you can clearly see I've got two positives and two negatives, so it's overall ba all balanced. Plus, each individual atom is balanced. 
So when I'm assigning electrons to an atom for formal charge, it's different from when I'm assigning electrons to an atom for the noble gas configuration. And for the noble gas configuration of the hydrogen on the right, how many electrons does it have? Two. That gives it the same number as helium. For the hydrogen on the left, for its noble gas configuration, how many electrons does it have? Two. That gives it the same noble gas, that gives it the same number of electrons as helium. But if I'm looking at the charge, I'm not assigning both electrons to the hydrogen on the right and both electrons to the hydrogen on the left. I only have two electrons. I don't have four electrons. I've got two protons and two electrons. So when I'm assigning the electrons to see if the charge is balanced, I have to split up the bond. A shared pair represents two electrons, and one electron will go to balance the charge of one atom that's sharing them. The other electron will be balancing the charge of the other atom that's sharing them. So for those two hydrogens, there's no formal charge. Each hydrogen, as we said, to be neutral, a hydrogen needs one valence electron. And how many am I assigning? I'm assigning for this hydrogen one electron to balance its charge, right? That's creating a balanced equal number of positive and negative. And then for the other hydrogen, I had the same thing. So each hydrogen has one electron assigned to it to balance its charge. Right, so there's a difference between that and the noble gas configuration. So hopefully you can see the charge is balanced here, and I get a balanced charge because the one valence electron that hydrogen needs is balanced with the one it has assigned to it, which gives me zero charge for the hydrogen, zero formal charge. I'm not assigning both electrons to it for its charge because if I assign both electrons, that would be one, which is the number it needs to be balanced and neutral, minus two assigned, that will give me a negative one, which is not the correct formal charge for the hydrogen. I can see I don't have a negative overall, overall charge on each hydrogen. I can see that they're balanced and neutral. So let's look at the carbon example then that was a, a little bit more complicated. So if this is my molecule and I'm analyzing the formal charge on the carbon, what we were saying was since carbon is in group 4A, it really needs four valence electrons to be neutral. So if I can assign four electrons around it, that will make its charge balanced. So clearly I have two, four, six, eight for its noble gas configuration. So that's good. It has a complete octet. It has a noble gas configuration. So it's stable in that regard. But if it's not charge balanced, it won't be maybe as stable as it could be. So I have to look at both the noble gas configuration by looking at all the electrons around it, including the lone pairs and shared pairs, but for, I also have to look at whether or not it's charge balanced. So to be charge balanced, carbon needs to have four valence electrons around it, assigned to it to balance its charge. And so just like for the hydrogen in the last example where we didn't assign both shared electrons to the same to one atom and then sh assign both shared electrons to the other atom that's sharing them, we have to split those up to assign them for charge. So if I'm looking at <coughs> subtracting the the number it needed it needs to be neutral minus the number assigned, that's the formula. Right? And it makes sense because if that needs 4 to be neutral, if I were to assign 4 to it, then it would be 4 minus 4 and the overall charge would be 0 and it would be neutral and it would be balanced. If it needs 4 to be neutral but I'm assigning 5 or 6, then I've got too much negative and when I take 4 minus 5, I'm going to end up with a negative 1 and that would be showing that that carbon has too much negative around it and it has an overall imbalance in charge with too much negative or a negative one overall charge on that specific atom. That would tell me that the atom isn't as stable as it could be. It's the most stable structures will have both the noble gas configuration which it has, but also a balanced charge, which it does not have, if I find that out. So to assign the, to assign the electrons, I add up the num all the lone pair electrons plus half of the bonded. 
just like we did with the hydrogen. And if it's sharing those electrons, but think about this hydrogen, this hydrogen has a proton. It needs one of the electrons in a bond to balance its charge. So only one of the electrons from the shared pair can go toward balancing the charge of the carbon. They're both, both electrons in a shared pair are satisfying both noble gas configurations. But just in terms of counting up all of the charges and making sure whether they're balanced or not, only one of the electrons from a shared pair can count toward each atom's charge balance. So how many are assigned to this carbon? Well, I've got two lone pair electrons. And I've got one from each of the shared pairs. So half of the six shared. So that comes down to four minus two plus three, or four minus five, or negative one. So then I would label that carbon to show that it has a negative formal charge and that it's not as stable as it could be. You said it's half because the, the carbon and the hydrogen are being shared. Those electrons order, right? Right. And then six because two four six. If you counted both electrons in this shared pair for the carbon's charge, you would have nothing to count toward balancing the hydrogen's charge. You have to split the shared pairs evenly in terms of counting them yeah. to see if they balance the charge. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, if I have a if I have a double bond like in this case here between these two oxygens, that's four electrons. So half of them will count toward balancing the charge of one oxygen, the other half will count toward balancing the charge of the other oxygen. So that's what this formula is. It's the number of the number of valence electrons it normally needs for it to be neutral. And I can find that easily from the periodic table if it's a main group, group A element. Minus all the lone pair electrons plus half of the shared electrons. That's the formula. And that is the formula that we need if we want to have a situation where we're comparing how many electrons this atom needs versus how many it actually has. And that will tell you whether the charge around that atom in, as an individual atom is balanced. Questions about that? Right. Well, maybe let's just do this ozone example then, just to make sure we've got this. So we want to assign formal charges to each of the oxygens. So if I'm analyzing for oxygen, applying the formula, the formal charge is going to be equal to the normal number of valence electrons oxygen would have to be neutral, and oxygen is in column 6A, so that's 6, right? If it had 6 around it, it, if it only had 6 around it, it wouldn't be a noble gas configuration. If it has 8 around it, but only 6 of those 8 count toward its noble gas, or toward its uh, formal charge, that would be ideal. Because, so when I, if I come up with this Lewis structure, I come up with this based on what we talked about last time. I come up with this based on the idea where I only have so many valence electrons to put in. I want to arrange them in ways so that each atom, including the shared electrons, has eight. But that might not be the most stable arrangement. I need to also look at when I put the electrons around in this way, does that create any areas where I've got too many electrons and too much negative? maybe other areas where maybe I have not enough negative and too much positive. That will help me recognize, if I, if I see that happening, it will help me recognize that if I've got too many electrons in this area, I've got a lot of negative formal charge over here, maybe I should arrange them different, move some electrons to a different area, so I don't have so many in that area. So each oxygen needs six assigned to it to be neutral. So let's call this oxygen one, two, and three. So we can keep them separate. So it's going to be 6 minus the number assigned. So for oxygen 1, it's going to be 6 minus how many can we assign? We're assigning all the lone pair electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, plus half of the two 
four shared electrons. That equals zero. That oxygen is stable and balanced. It has both a noble gas configuration and six electrons specifically assigned to it to keep its charge balanced, which is the number it needs to be balanced. If we look at oxygen two, same analysis. It also needs six. In this case, though, for oxygen two, I've got one, two, only two that it owns all to itself. All right, any lone pair, I'm not going to count half of them because the lone pair electrons are only on that atom. Both lone pair electrons count toward balancing the charge of that atom because they're only owned by that atom. They're not shared with other atoms. So that's two. And now I've got two, four, six shared. Right? So if all the other electrons, if the other six electrons are shared, only half of them can count toward the oxygen's charge because the other half must be counting toward balancing the charge of the other atom the oxygen sharing them with. So that's going to give me a plus one, six minus five. So I need to show that in my Lewis structure. If you draw a Lewis structure and there are formal charges, but you haven't labeled the formal charges, it's not complete. It's misleading to write it that way. You need to show where the charges are if there are charges. And so then oxygen three is going to be six minus, in this case I can assign six just from the lone pairs. It's not sharing those with anything the way I have it drawn. And there are two electrons shared in that one single bond, so that's going to give me a negative one. So now I've got the formal charges shown on that molecule. That gives me a lot more information about whether the molecule may be stable or not. And now we can explain why in the atmosphere there's very little ozone compared to how much O2 there is. Because in O2, if I were to look at the formal charge, it'd be six minus for an oxygen, one, two, three, four lone pair electrons plus half of the two, four shared, that equals zero. So in oxygen, in a molecular oxygen, O2, there is no formal charge. So that has no gas configuration and there's no area of imbalance in charge, so it's stable. You know, if I have this molecule and there's area on the outside with negative and an area on the inside with positive, if that starts colliding with other molecules in the atmosphere, it might start exchanging electrons or forming bonds in ways that will allow it to try to reach a more stable state with more balanced formal charge. Questions about that? So the overall molecule is neutral, but within that molecule I have individual areas that have too much negative or not enough negative. That creates a situation where if that area of the molecule specifically like this area of the molecule, because it's negative, if it were to come in contact with something that had like an exposed nucleus, these electrons, because there's too much of them around here and they're repelling one another, they might try to get away from that oxygen and start attracting to another positive charge. They right? would have too many electrons around an atom, that causes shielding, they get pushed out from the nucleus, they're not as attracted and held as tightly to that nucleus and they can start reacting and attracting to other nuclei more, more effectively. So it is, it's probably better for the molecule if, if the overall charge is balanced, right, because the plus one and the negative one balance out. I don't have an overall charge on the whole thing. If I did, then it would probably be even more reactive and more unstable, but even small areas within the molecule that have an imbalance in charge make the molecule less stable. And if there's a way for me to arrange the electrons differently, where I could balance all the atoms formal charges and make double gas configurations, that would probably be more likely for the molecule to exist in that form. Mm -hmm. This is the power of formal charge. Yeah. Are you talking about coordinate covalent bonds in the context of the number of bonds and noble gas configuration? Um, I guess all I really understand about coordinate covalent bonds is that 
the uh, electrons are more attracted to one element oh. versus the other. Yeah, that's not really creating instability like formal presence. So that is just, what he's talking about is a situation where you have a highly polar covalent bond. And coordination bonds are unusual because they're a covalent bond that forms between a metal and a non-metal. So we're not really, we don't focus on that until Gen Chem 2. So for now, in the context of what you're talking about, you know, you could talk about water and calculate the formal charge on the water. We'll talk more about this next time, but just to briefly answer your question. If I calculate the formal charge for the oxygen and the, for the hydrogens, it's zero. It's balanced for all the atoms. But because the shared electrons are not really exactly shared evenly, that actually creates some partial charge on the oxygen and the hydrogen. So when I think about the electrons, and you know what we've been saying here is, if I have a shared pair of electrons, it's really the same as thinking of two electrons there, where one of the electrons actually counts toward balancing the charge of the oxygen and the other is balancing the charge of the hydrogen, right? And if they're shared perfectly evenly, that would work out and there would be no charge anywhere. But because the hydrogen only has one proton in its nucleus and the oxygen has eight, granted the hydrogen has no shielding and the oxygen has a little shielding, but they don't have the same electronegativity. Right? From last time we said electronegativity is the tendency to attract shared electrons. So if those electrons are shared between the oxygen and the hydrogen and they have a different electronegativity, the oxygen's electronegativity happens to be greater. It's 3.5, the hydrogen is 2.1. That's a pretty big difference on a scale from zero to four. That means that really these electrons aren't gonna be totally shared evenly. They'll probably be on average, their electron density will be positioned much more closer to the atom that's more electronegative. So that means that maybe only a fraction of one electron actually is around the hydrogen at any given moment. And so the hydrogen, it won't have a full positive because it is still sharing a fraction of, at least a fraction of electron to balance out as positive. So we would show a partial positive there and a result of too many electrons around the, the oxygen, a partial negative there. That's not necessarily making it unstable. That's just a natural consequence of having atoms with different electronegativity. I mean, it does make it unstable to an extent because you know if, this, if these electrons aren't sufficiently surrounding the hydrogen, that positive charge could get attracted. And it's only a partial positive. It's not a full charge, so it's not really reactive or attractive, but it could get attracted to some other atom that has a negative and wants maybe, you know, needs that positive to keep its charge balanced out. So that, I mean, that, that's the, the cause of a lot of different reactions. And we'll see that more later in the semester in, in, in the gen gen two. Yeah. Other questions? About anything? It was um, on sulfur and three oxygens to uh, negative two, thank you. Mm -hmm. Minus. So it's a matter of uh, matching the, the right one. <coughs> the, uh, that was uh, valid or invalid. It was just hard at counting the electrons for telling the difference with the two dots in the S, for example. Uh, so, what was the question? To draw a Lewis structure and calculate formal charge? Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Okay, so for this one, let's talk about it. If you want to get formal charge, you have to have a reasonable Lewis structure first. So this, we, know, we also need to know at least their relative electronegativity is that the sulfur is going to be less than the oxygen. So the sulfur should be in the center. And I want to connect my oxygens to it. So this also goes for the lab because this is very similar to some of the lab. You want to avoid connecting oxygen to oxygen. Highly electronegative atoms like oxygen do not bond well to other highly electronegative atoms, right? Highly, high electronegativity means it's attracting shared electrons. So if this oxygen is attracting sh the shared electrons to it and this oxygen is attracting the shared electrons to it, like neither oxygen can really pull those electrons in and satisfy the electrons because they're like a tug of war that no one can win. 
It's better when a highly electronegative atom is bonded to a low electronegativity atom because then the electrons can really get pulled in close to the nucleus of the more electronegative atom, spend time next to its more attractive positive charge and be stabilized. So you want to try to draw a skeletal structure that avoids highly electronegative atoms attracted to other highly electronegative atoms if possible. So that's just a general guideline. So I've got my skeletal structure. Then I want to count up the number of valence electrons. So six from the sulfur, three times six for all three oxygens, plus two more because I've got two extra negatives. So that gets me to 26. So far I've used two, four, six. So that gets me to 20 left I have to put in. And then the next step for drawing a Lewis structure is to put those in on the more electronegative outside atoms first. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Once I fill up the noble gas configurations of the outside atoms, if I still have more electrons, since I've only used 18, I still have two left, I then put those on the central atom. Then I look at it once I've put all my electrons in and I decide whether the outside atoms need to start sharing electrons with the central atom. In this case, it doesn't really because the central atom does have a noble gas configuration. It's got two, four, six, eight counting toward its noble gas configuration. And each, ox each oxygen has eight counting toward its noble gas configuration. So that's a reasonable Lewis structure. So then for formal charge, all the oxygens have the same, in this molecule, all the oxygens have the same electron arrangement around, right? They have one bond and three lone pairs. So I don't have to calculate the formal charge three times. I just need to calculate it once for one of those oxygens. And so the formal charge will be equal to six minus, because six is the normal number of valence electrons it needs around it to be balanced. The number assigned will be one, two, three, four, five, six that it has all to itself, plus half of the two it's sharing, and that gives me a negative one. So each oxygen here, and the way the structure is drawn, carries a negative one formal charge. That's a lot of negative on each one of those sites. So then I want to also calculate the formal charge for the sulfur. The sulfur also needs six to be balanced. It's in the same column as oxygen. And assigned to it, there are only two electrons it has all to itself, two electrons from its lone pair, and now it's sharing six, so half of the six shared is going to be five minus, uh, six minus five, or a plus one. So I've got a positive charge there. When you're assigning formal charges, the sum of the formal charges must equal the overall charge on the molecule. So if I give you a formula like O3, and there's no charge shown, the formal charges have to balance. If I give you one where there's an overall negative two, I must have enough formal charges so when I add them all together, they add up to negative two. So here I've got a plus and a negative balance, but I've still got two extra negatives that are not balanced out. So that means at least my structure is plausible. If the sum of the formal charges you draw on the molecule does not equal the overall charge on the formula, you do not have the correct number of electrons or atoms in your structure. You did not make the structure correctly. So that would be a formal charge there. Uh, that would be how to assign it for that structure. We're going to talk about, about resonance as we go through, but there's resonance in the structure as well, so we might as well mention that now. So, <coughs> resonance, uh, you can recognize that sometimes when you see formal charge because resonance is created when electrons are allowed to shift around in an orbital that extends over multiple atoms. So it's kind of similar to a single bond in a way, but it's different in a way as well. So what we said about a single bond was that those are electrons in an orbital that extends over both atoms. But that type of orbital where I have a single bond cannot move around. I cannot move the electrons in this area 
really they're isolated between uh, these two atoms. Lone pair electrons, though, and double bond or triple bond electrons can move around because of the type of orbital they're in. So when I think about a lone pair of electrons, it isn't an orbital that's extending out of the plane of the paper, and the sulfur also has an orbital extending out of the plane of the paper that is empty, and when those orbitals overlap, that allows a lone pair of electrons to move in and create a double bond. So when you're thinking about resonance, if you have a Lewis structure, you always want to analyze it after, after you've drawn it and ask yourself, are there any lone pairs or double bonds that could shift around to a different location and without making the molecule less stable? If it makes it way less stable, it's not likely to happen because the whole point of resonance is to stabilize the molecule. So there's a couple patterns in resonance that, that you'll see. So you could have a, just generically an atom with a lone pair and it could move in here to form a double bond with a neighboring atom instead of being a lone pair. So that's one way that electrons can move. You can also have the opposite. You could have electrons move out from a double bond and become a lone pair. The third one involves a double bond moving from one position between two atoms to the position between two other atoms that are neighboring. Right, so there's really only three ways electrons can move. They can move where a lone pair moves in to form a double bond, a double bond moves out to form a lone pair, or a double bond transitions to the very next spot to make a double bond in a different spot. <coughs> there's really only three. So in resonance, I'm not like taking a pair of electrons off an atom and just flopping it on some other atom somewhere else in the molecule. They have to move in one of these three ways. And that's limited based on the way that the electrons uh, can move around in their orbital. So, yes? Yeah, ozone can definitely do that as well. We'll talk about that when we see that example. In the context of this example, I'm prompted to recognize the resonance because I see lone pairs, and I realize when I have lone pairs, I have the possibility of this type of electron movement. Plus, since there's too much negative around each one of these oxygens and too much positive on the sulfur, I realize that this positive charge in the middle is going to attract the negative charged electrons on the outside and they're going to want to move in and be attracted to that. If I had a negative in the middle, it wouldn't attract electrons toward it. Right? So the electron movement of these types are usually, the electrons will usually move according to one of these patterns in order to stabilize some charge that's present. So if I take, um, if I make a little space here, if I think about moving one of these pairs, any one of the lone pairs and any one of the oxygens in toward the sulfur, I can represent that molecule with a different structure. Now the oxygen there only has two lone pairs. And now my structure has only two total formal charges. Once those electrons move in, if I recalculate the formal charge of this oxygen, it will be zero. If I recalculate the formal charge of the sulfur, it will be zero, right? Because I'm assigning two plus half of the eight here, which would be four. Two plus four is six, so that would be six minus six, or zero. So now both of these structures can contribute to what the real structure looks like. Right. So, can you do that? You can only do it if it doesn't make the if it doesn't make the molecule less stable. So, right, right. So that, that's a great point. So what what we can say is, for carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, for anything in row two, you cannot put more than ten electrons around it because for those atoms, their valence level is the second level, and at the most. I'm sorry, you can't put more than eight electrons around. At the most, it can have eight valence electrons in the second level. If you put more in, it, there's no space in the second level to put more in, it can't accept more electrons. But for sulfur, phosphorus, and below, row three and below, that's the third, fourth, fifth energy level. Those atoms do have enough space to fit more than eight electrons without having to put the new electrons into an entire, entirely new level. So if sulfur can have 
10 total valence electrons around. Now, it is not maybe the most stable arrangement because it doesn't have a noble gas configuration, but at least it has a balanced charge. So when you can see two structures that are only different in the positioning of the electrons when the electrons have been moved in one of these three ways, they're only different in the positioning of the electrons and they're both somewhat stable. I mean, I can see some advantages. In this one, it has fewer formal charges on the structure, but this is one has the advantage that the sulfur does have a noble gas configuration. That means that you've got resonance. And in resonance, we can draw individual representations of different positions for the electrons, but what we know really exists is neither of those, what really exists is the average of them. And what is really happening in resonance is that one of these pairs of electrons, the ones I'm showing moving in, or on the top I could show it moving back out, right, so this structure on top, these electrons could move back out, so these two go back and forth. In reality though, Resonance is not a situation where sometimes it looks like this and sometimes it looks like that. And that's very difficult to wrap your head around. Right? Because we're thinking of the electrons as particles. That's not really how they are though. Right? The electrons are not particles that are sometimes here or sometimes here in making the double bond. What happens when resonance occurs is that this electron pair that's in an orbital on the oxygen isn't really in an orbital on the oxygen. And if I think about the electron pair in the double bond, it's not really in that orbital either. It's in an orbital that extends over both atoms and allows the electrons to be in the space between the sulfur and the oxygen and in the space just on the oxygen at the same time. Right? Because when we think about the electrons as a wave, we, we think about them as being an orbital with electron density spread out in that orbital, and the electron density is everywhere in, that, everywhere in that orbital at the same time. And so if my orbital includes both of these areas, the area where the lone pair is and the area where the double bond is, then I have a situation where the electrons are in both of those areas at the same time. So neither of those structures exists. What exists is the hybrid or the average of them where the electrons are in both of those areas at the same time. It's helpful, though, to see the individual structures because then I can see that they're similar in stability. And when I see the individual structures drawn, that helps me to get a better visual of what the average of those structures, what the real structure actually looks like. And as far as formal charge goes, either of those one Yeah, this one, is, this one is superior because it has less formal charge. But this one is superior because it has a noble gas configuration for the sulfur. So which is, which is better and there I mean there's other factors that we don't have time to get into which tell me that this one is actually the better structure but there's no way for you to know that based on what we said so when you see a situation where both structures look reasonable then you should recognize that the real structure will be an average of those it might not be an exactly 50 50 average but it will be somewhat of an average of those Resonance is unfortunately, because we have to cover so many different topics in this class, not something we can spend a lot of time on. It's kind of abstract, it's hard for you to maybe really feel confident with, uh, but it is something that you would go into a lot of detail in organic chemistry if you take that. So it is helpful to kind of get the basis of it down here if you, if you do plan on taking organic chemistry. Is that the second structure? The one on top? Well, because the formula, you kind of erased it, but because the formula was SO3 2 minus, I still have to have the sum of my formal charges equaling the overall charge on the structure. So I know when the, when the formula given to me has an, an overall charge on it, I'm never going to be able to create a Lewis structure that has zero formal charge. So that's the best I can do in terms of making the, the, the least amount of formal charge possible. Other question? The, the X and Y of the two lines, uh -huh. the arrow is pointing to it. What was that meant again? Over here? Right here. Yeah, right this one? The one below it. This one. Yeah, so this is showing that if you have a situation where there's a double bond, one possible way the electrons can move in resonance 
is for those electrons, one of the pairs of the double bond, not both, but just one, to move out to only one atom instead of being shared between both atoms, it can move out to one atom and exist as a lone pair. Become the electron. Right. So a double bond can become a lone pair. Uh, that's one of the ways that you can move electrons in resonance to try to create the different resonance contributors that uh, are contributing to what the real average structure looks like. Other question? Any other questions from the textbook or anything else I ask you guys to correct this? Alright, so um, just to let you know, this would have been the quiz question. I'm not going to give it to you because uh, there's a lot of practice uh, for the molecules related to lab. But um, if I remember, I want to go through it at the end of the lecture because it's a good example. And I want to give you, you know, at this point, some examples that are a little bit more challenging so that when we have the exam and you have those challenging examples, they're not uh, totally su uh, surprised to you. So um, let's talk more about formal charge and resonance, look at more examples, and then we'll do that more challenging one. So with ozone, as we said, we were able to calculate the formal charges. We had a zero formal charge here. If it's zero, you don't have to show it, because then it looks like an oxygen atom or a, uh, an electron or something like that. If there's no formal charge, just don't write anything on the atom. Here we said we calculated a plus one. Here we calculated a negative one. Right? So that makes the molecule less stable. And when we see formal charges, we realize that it would be better if we could arrange the electrons differently to avoid that formal charge. And if I have the possibility for resonance, the resonance may be stabilizing that formal charge. And so how would that work on this structure? Well, there's three ways electrons can move in resonance. Are any one of those three ways applicable here? Yeah, in this case, I need to employ two of those three ways at the same time. So sometimes in resonance, you won't just see one pair of electrons moving. You might see two pairs moving at the same time. So one of those patterns was I can take a lone pair and move it in to make a double bond. But if I only do that and I make a double bond there and I redraw the structure, this oxygen in the center will have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And an element that's in row 2 can never have more than 8 because there isn't space in that valence level to hold more than 8 electrons. So I can't do that unless I, at the same time, use another pattern that we saw, which is to move electrons from a double bond to create a lone pair. So that's what I would do. So this first arrow here is probably the one that you would be instinctively uh, likely to draw first. And the reason for that is because this area actually got too much negative. If you've got formal charges in your structure, try to draw the arrows and move the electrons in a way that makes sense. Don't move electrons toward a negative, where there's already too many electrons. Move them away from a negative toward a positive. So if I've got too many electrons here, I've determined the formal charge on this atom is a negative one. I would move electrons away from that. But then I say, well, I can't just move them in here. Also, I can't take these electrons and like pop them onto another atom. They have to follow one of those three patterns. So if I just move them in here and make a double bond, that's going to be too many electrons around this central atom. Even though it's got a positive and it wants to attract those in, it doesn't have space to put them in its valence level. It already has a full valence level. So if I'm going to move these in, I have to move the other ones out. There's no way to avoid that. And so I would have to have two arrows to show that resonance where um, now the oxygen on the right hand side has formed a double bond and only has two lone pairs on it because one moved in to form that double bond and the oxygen on the left hand side now only has a single bond and three lone pairs because the pair of electrons moved out. So now when I look at the formal charges and I calculate them I still have a positive on the center oxygen. It still has the same 
arrangement, three bonds and a lone pair. But now the octet on the left has three lone pairs and one bond, which is the same as what this has, so now it becomes negative. Good question. So, yes. Just to review. Yeah. When uh, doing the Willis dot structure and then connecting them, uh, do you automatically do it because you remember the top of your mind of dot dot and then uh, this equals to eight or six for the oxygen atom? For no, I'm just, for the, to come up with this Lewis structure to begin with, I'm starting with the formula and following the steps we learned last time, which would be to start with making a skeletal structure, count up the valence electrons, put them in on the outside first, And then if I still have more, which I do, I put them on the central oxygen. Okay, so I've used all 18, and then I realize, and this, this is a good question, because at this point, and I allowed me to remember something I forgot to say, which is when I'm drawing the Lewis structure to begin with, there's another clue to prompt you that resonance could be happening. Because when you get to this situation, and this will happen a lot, where the central atom, I put all 18 electrons in, the central atom doesn't have a, it doesn't have enough to make a thermal gas configuration. And so what do we do in that situation? We look for an outside atom that has extra electrons that can move in. If I've got more than one option, I've got resonance. Because I can move this pair in and make this resonance structure, or I can move the other pair in and make the other resonance structure. So that helps me to realize resonance will occur because what, what is resonance? It's different ways to draw the structure that are only different in the positioning of the electrons. And if I've got different options for positioning the electrons, that's resonance. So if I happen to choose this option here, I get this structure. If I happen to choose this option here, then I get the other structure. So is this resonance actually stabilizing the molecule? Either way, I've got a contributor with a positive and a negative. So I've got two contributors that look like they're equal stability. Both of these contributors have complete double gas configuration. They're both the same stability. They're only different in the position of the electrons, and the position of the electrons doesn't really allow me to alleviate all the formal charge because no matter what I do, I end up with a contributor that has some formal charge. Even in that context, it's still stabilizing to have resonance. Because what, remember what resonance is. Resonance does not mean that I've got this structure sometimes that's unstable and then sometimes it converts to this structure that's also unstable, which would be a situation where the molecule would be unstable no matter what. That's not what's happening. Okay, It's not an equilibrium where sometimes it reacts uh, to produce one structure and sometimes it produces the other structure. In reality, what resonance is, if these electrons have the ability to move over here and then move back, that means there's an orbital extending over all three atoms. And the electrons that are moving, this pair and this pair, there's actually two orbitals because I have to hold both electrons, but those two orbitals extend over all three atoms and those electrons are spread out over all three nuclei. That is stabilizing. Because if I didn't have resonance and I just had one structure at a time, well, then the electrons are localized in one area. They can't move over multiple atoms. They're stuck either on an atom or between two atoms. But because resonance creates a large orbital that extends over multiple atoms, these electrons that are in resonance, the two pairs that are moving, are actually in a molecular orbital extending over all three atoms at the same time. That means the electrons can spread out from one another more effectively because their orbital is larger, it's spreading over more atoms, less repulsion between the electrons when they spread out. Plus, they can attract to all three nuclei at the same time. That means they can form more attraction. All instantaneously because they're in an orbital, and an orbital is just an area where the electron density is distributed. So the real structure I might want to draw just to show that those electrons are in movement, I can use a dotted line to show the area that they're moving over. However, there are some that are not moving at all, right? The middle lone pair is not moving, so I wouldn't show that moving around. Each oxygen has at least two 
Loan pairs, oops, I shouldn't circle that one probably. Each auction has two loan pairs that are not moving, so I can indicate those are stationary as well. But this gives me more of a, an idea of what the real structure looks like. You gotta remember, residents, the individual contributors don't exist. What exists is the average or hybrid. And so in the average or hybrid, the electrons are spread out over more atoms, they get to form more attractions to more nuclei, they get to avoid repulsions between one another, and in this case, and in many other cases, it cuts down on the quantity of formal charge on an atom. Because if this structure existed, I would have a full negative, unstable area on one oxygen. If this structure existed, I would have still an unstable negative area on an oxygen. But since the average of those two exists, that means each of the outside oxygen only carries a partial negative. Right? These electrons are not here. They're also not over here. They're all over all three. So the extra negative that those two oxygens share is spread out evenly over the two outside oxygen. So really I would have the central oxygen has a positive either way. So on average, it's always going to have a full positive. That's a disadvantage. It makes the molecule a little bit unstable. But the full negative is shared evenly between the outside two oxygens because I've got two resonance structures that are equal in energy and contribute evenly to what the average of them should look like. So that gives me only a negative one spread out over two atoms, a negative one half on each. And a negative one half isn't as unstable, it's not as concentrated of a negative charge as a full negative one would be on one of those oxygens. So this slide was just about the formal charge. We already went through that. So let's look at a couple other examples. So let's look at NO3 minus. Look at that uh, Lewis structure and try to make sure we can draw the formal charges. So for that one, I would put the nitrogen in the center because its electronegativity is 3.0, oxygen is 3.5. By the way, if you don't have those numbers, you can still guess the electronegativity relative to one another because we know electronegativity follows the same trend as electron affinity, which is it increases as you go from left to right, as you put more protons in the atom. It increases as you go from the bottom to the top, as you have less shielding in the atom. So for nitrogen and oxygen, oxygen should they have similar amounts of shielding. Oxygen should have a greater attraction for electrons because it has more protons in its nucleus. So I want to put the oxygen on the outside where it's not forced to share a bunch of pairs of electrons. If it attracts the electrons more to itself, it's going to be more stable in a position where it can have more electrons to itself rather than a position where it's sharing all its electrons with other atoms in the center. So I've got my skeleton. Then I want to count up the number of valence electrons. So nitrogen's in 5A. It brings in 5. Oxygen's in 6A, and I've got three of those. Plus I have one extra electron due to the negative charge that's shown there. So that will give me 24 total valence electrons. So far I've used six to put my three bonds in. So now I have 18 left. So I'll start by putting those in on the atoms that attract them better, the ones with the higher electronegativity. So that's six, 12, 18. So how does the molecule look? Stable? What's wrong with it? Right. It doesn't have an oval gas configuration for the nitrogen. So we're talking about resonance and formal charge. Don't forget, the noble gas configuration is the primary thing you need to think about first. Try to get a noble gas configuration for all the atoms. So when I see that the nitrogen doesn't have eight, it only has six electrons around it, it needs more. So where is it going to get them? from one of the oxygens sharing electrons in to make a double bond. And that prompts me to recognize there's resonance because I could share the electrons here and make my double bond on this side, or I could share the electrons here and make my double bond on the bottom, or I could have shared them here and made my double bond on the top left. Either way, once I fill in the rest of the electrons that haven't moved in, that produces 
a Lewis structure that is the best Lewis structure I can come up with. However, when I realize that there's going to be resonance, I realize the real structure is not really going to look exactly like any one of these individual contributors. It's going to be the average of them. Right? That's what resonance indicates. But if we're just looking to calculate the formal charge for now, <coughs> we would use the formula. So on an exam, I'm not going to ask you to draw all the resonance contributors for a structure. I'm not going to ask you to draw a resonance hybrid or average of the con individual contributors. I'll probably just have, ask you to draw the best, most stable contributor you can. And then if there is resonance, just to explain how that resonance is there or indicate that there's the possibility of resonance for some structures, whereas for other structures there isn't. So if I ask you to draw an individual contributor or the best Lewis structure you can, you just need to come up with one reasonable contributor, which we have here, and then to calculate the formal charge. So for oxygen one, <coughs> it needs six electrons assigned to it to be balanced. It has six just from the lone pairs and one more from the shared pair. That's going to be a negative one. Oxygen two has the same exact format around it. I don't need to set up another formula. It's got six uh, uh, electrons in lone pairs plus one more from the shared pair, so that's going to give me the same calculation I did for oxygen one. For oxygen three, it needs six to be balanced. It's got four lone pair electrons around it and four shared, so only half of those count toward balancing its charge. That's zero, so I don't need to put anything next to it. And then for the nitrogen that's there, it's in group 5A, so it only needs five to be balanced. I don't have any lone pairs on it, and I have eight shared electrons around it, so that's five minus four, that's a plus one, so I need to show that. Questions about that? So this is me applying the formula for formal charge to each individual atom one at a time. Yeah, you, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, you, when you're calculating formal charge, it's not for the overall structure. I already know, because that was given to me, that the overall structure has a negative one. Formal charge is a way of calculating for individual atoms within the Lewis structure whether they have a balance in electrons or not. Then at the end, I, put, I should check my work to make sure that the sum of the formal charges, a negative one plus a positive one plus a negative one, equals the overall charge, which is a negative one. And it does, so that means that at least I know that my structure may be correct. If it, if it didn't equal uh, the overall charge, I would know my structure could not be correct. All right, so let's look at CO2. All right, so there's really two ways you could draw CO2. When you come up with the Lewis structure, you'd be putting the carbon in the center since it's less electronegative. And you would put the valence electrons in on the outside first. You would get to this point, at which point you, uh, you put in all the electrons you have. So what can you do? You've got to share more electrons. So your instinct may be to make the molecule symmetrical. That may or may not get you the best structure, so I wouldn't necessarily rely on that. If you share one pair of electrons from both sides, you get this structure. If you were instead to share two electron pairs from one side and none from the other side, you would get this structure. Either way, you make noble gas configurations for the carbon and the oxygens. So those structures are both reasonable. However, once you calculate the formal charge and you realize that you're assigning too many electrons around this oxygen, so it's got a negative one, 
and this oxygen doesn't have enough assigned to it, so it has a positive one, then you realize this is not nearly as stable as the structure where everything is balanced out. So we, uh, the way that CO2 exists, the way that the electrons are arranged in a molecule of CO2 is that they're arranged uh, to have two double bonds at the same time between the carbon and the oxygen. Because that creates a balance in formal charge and noble gas configurations for the atoms. Questions about that? All right, so let's um, take a break and then we'll come back and do this example here. <coughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm.